Well, everybody, today is the day that we can talk about the performance of Intel's Arc B580, their latest sort of dagger jab into the heart of the more affordable GPU market. Now, this video, this video is it's going to be a little bit of a different one for us because I wanted to cut through all the fluff and I just wanted to give you guys as many benchmarks as we possibly could. Now, there's a lot of things to know about the B580 and I covered almost all of them in a video right up here. But let's just sum this up very, very quickly about what Intel is supposed to be offering here. The Arc B580 is a 12 gigabyte, $250 GPU based on Intel's newest battle mage architecture. It's meant to compete against the RTX 4060 and RX 7600, two cards with substantially less memory, while also replacing the A580 and A750 in Intel's own lineup. Meanwhile, power consumption numbers point towards there being a big step forward in performance per watt versus the A series. On paper, at least, it's certainly an interesting option for gamers. So Intel's strategy here, it's pretty straightforward, right? They want to get into the market as quickly as possible before the competitors launch their competing designs, if those designs actually hit the $250 mark. So they, they want to sort of like nibble away a little bit of the market share away from NVIDIA and AMD. And were they really able to do that? Well, to find out, we're testing in a pretty straightforward manner here. We're doing it against GPUs that are likely to be cross-shopped against the B580. I mean, sure, some of them, like the 7600 XT, cost a bit more, while others are going to cost a whole lot less, especially the A580 and A750, which are on some heavy discounts right now. Our new charts need a quick call out to since they're designed to give you a dual sided perspective depending on the resolution you're using or one that you plan to actually upgrade to in the future. On the left side there's 1080p representing a situation I'm sure most people shopping for a $250 GPU will actually find themselves in. Meanwhile with 1440p eating up a bigger chunk of the overall market it's here too and this is a resolution you, you, you have to think back in time that was typically a bridge too far for most GPUs in this price category. But you know what shouldn't be a bridge too far for most people? That is an affordable, great looking AIO. And we've got one here from this video sponsor, Montech. Montech with another insane value product, the Hyperflow ARGB AIOs, available in black or white, 240 or 360 sizes, with full platform compatibility and friendly tools along the way, that not only look gorgeous with pump lighting and matching blade illumination, but also performance that should satisfy with any any hot silicon thanks to high speed fans, high density fins on the rad, a good pump and daisy chain fans for easy cable management, all backed by the six year warranty so you don't have to worry. Check it out below. All right, with that little interlude out of the way, it's time to head right into benchmarking, starting with Alan Wake. And right away, it's sort of like a yin and yang situation here. On one hand, the B580 absolutely demolishes the A580 and A750 while also beating the A770. It even trades blows with the RTX 4060, but unfortunately, those two AMD cards, well, they're almost untouchable here. Black Myth Wukong is one of the newer games on our list, and it just feels like Intel might still be playing a little bit of catch up in the driver department. At 1080p, the B580 does give you substantially better performance than the A series and fares pretty well against the AMD alternatives, yet it also gets hammered by the RTX 4060. At that higher resolution though, it claws back a lot of its lost performance against the RTX 4060, and that could point towards the benefits of its larger VRAM footprint. CS2 is one of those games where Nvidia is really hard to beat because they've put a massive emphasis into boosting performance in popular online shooters like this. Here, the B580 makes some massive strides over its predecessors at both resolutions and also manages to win pretty convincingly against the RX 7600 cards. I also want to point out those 1% lows at 1440p. While the ARC card narrowly gets beaten in average FPS by the 4060, it provides better overall frame time consistency. Cyberpunk on the other hand, it loves having access to more GPU memory along with a wider interface and that plays a huge role in 1440p performance. I mean the difference is like night and day. At 1080p the B580 can't quite match the 7600X or the 4060 for that matter, but it simply dominates both of those cards at 1440p. And moving on, Doom, it shows the exact same thing that Cyberpunk did. The Arc B580 might be really strong at 1080p, but it actually starts to pull away at those higher resolutions. And that sort of proves why all the numbers in Intel's first presentations looked so damn good. They simply laser focused on the B580's best case scenario. So look, Space Marine, I'm gonna pause it here just for a couple of seconds because it presented a pretty big red flag 
flag for us. On the surface of things, it might look like the B580 has a ridiculously huge advantage over the A series. I mean, it isn't even close. But what's not shown here is the fact Intel seems to have solely focused on optimizing for the B580 and didn't do the same with the A series. So while it performs decently at both resolutions, its predecessors, they obviously underperform. I mean, check out this gameplay from an A770. You'll notice a bunch of rendering issues, the most obvious being shadow rendering hiccups that are all over the place, and that leads to image flickering. The B580, on the other hand, well, it didn't exhibit any of these problems whatsoever. Hogwarts is another great example of a game where Nvidia has found a special sauce for optimizations, whereas Intel and AMD have started to fall a bit behind. I mean, the B580 is technically the fastest card here if we solely focus on averages, but those 1% lows, they tell a whole other story. Compared to the RTX 4060, it delivers a terrible overall gameplay experience that's filled with micro stutters. And things really tend to flip all over the place with the winners and losers being very much game dependent. Hit on a title where Intel still hasn't found the right optimization setup and you get a situation like Hogwarts or Space Marine like we saw before. They'll find one where they've got everything nailed down like in Horizon Forbidden West and suddenly the ARC B580 looks like an awesome GPU for 250 bucks. And a lot of these optimization issues seem to be narrowly focused on newer titles too, like Black Ops 6. Obviously there's still a whole lot left in the tank, but lackluster performance on either day one or even during the first month after a game's launch is going to be an ongoing issue for Intel. Ironically though, Rainbow Six represents the exact opposite situation as some other games did. The Arc A series do pretty well here, but the B580's frame rate consistency, well, it just falls off a cliff and even its average numbers should be a whole lot better. This is not a good look. I can't emphasize that enough. Not at all. Rainbow Six is one of the most popular games right now, and yet here's Intel's brand new GPU suffering from performance hiccups that shouldn't even be there. And when you compare those numbers to the ones here in Spider-Man, well, that whole lack of consistency narrative comes up yet again, because the B580 posts some class leading numbers at both resolutions. They're over 30% better than the A770 and lead the A750 by about 50% while also putting the screws to more expensive AMD and Nvidia cards. It's something we've all been waiting for. And yet for every Spider-Man situation, there's a Starfield. I mean, sure, the B580 puts down some big numbers against Intel's own A series and make no mistake about it, that's something to be celebrated. But Nvidia and AMD convincingly beat it. Yes, with cards that cost more, but both of those companies seem to have a better track record when it comes to drivers and in-game support. And it really is a bloody shame that consistency wasn't better overall because there are some absolute flashes of brilliance here when Intel hits their stride. Pair up functioning optimizations with the B580's obviously very, very capable hardware, and you get a product that can beat the best GPUs this price point can offer right now. So, okay, that's in-game performance, which was, I would call it, interesting, but that's not the only thing that makes up a GPU these days. We also have to talk about power consumption because when it comes to using this GPU in an older existing system, power consumption, it can't go straight off the charts. It needs to be kept within certain bounds. So let's dive into this since we went pretty deep with power consumption testing and against the A750, the B580 shows improvements right across the board in every single game. Sometimes it's as little as a few watts here and there, while at other times there's a reduction of almost 30 watts or more. And moving on to the A770, well, it isn't even close with the new card needing much, much less power despite outperforming it by a pretty wide margin in most situations. Intel made some pretty bold claims about Battle Mage's performance per watt versus the previous generations. And these numbers, well, they really do validate those statements. Even against the RTX 3060, things look pretty good overall for the B580, though once again, that gap varies wildly from one game to the next. The only hiccup for Intel is that Nvidia's current generation RTX 4060 took an almost unbelievable step forward when it came to efficiency. As a result, it can generally beat the B580 in performance per watt by sometimes needing up to 40 watts less. On the other hand, AMD still lags behind both Nvidia and now Intel since their RX 7000 series doesn't offer load specific power modulation. So the RTX 7600 just goes out there and throws about 160 watts at every single game regardless 
regardless of how much juice might actually be necessary for optimal frame rates. As a result, the B580 tends to need less power, though there are some exceptions like Cyberpunk, Doom, and Warhammer 3. And even though temperatures are very much cooler dependent, the relatively simple dual slot heatsink on the B580 limited edition allows the core to run below 70 degrees in most situations. And look, gaming is one thing, right? But we all know at this point in time that GPUs are in a lot of these systems, not just to offer the best frame rates. What they're also there to do is offer huge amounts of compute for people who need them in STEM applications and creator workloads. And that is exactly what we also wanted to test here. Let's start with Premiere. And this is one program that's always benefited Intel GPUs since their quick sync video engine is able to enhance overall output performance, giving them a distinct edge over AMD and Nvidia. The B580 even has a slight edge here over the A series cards. Resolve meanwhile, well, it shows about the same thing versus the RX and RTX cards, but the B580 just gets creamed by its predecessors. Obviously that optimization word, well, it needs to factor into the equation again, because that's something that's clearly lacking here. We're still trying to understand exactly what's going on in this app specifically, but based on what Intel has said in their release notes for the last couple of months now, well, performance in Resolve seems to be an ongoing issue for them. And look, while rendering times might look great for Intel CPUs, we all have to level with each other here. Actual out put times for any NLE, like the ones that we're looking at, is a very, very minuscule part of any video editing process. A lot of your time is gonna be spent on video editing, color grading, adding effects, and a bunch of other things. And that is an area where AMD, and more specifically, Nvidia, have a clear and distinct advantage. And I wanted to focus on NVIDIA here for a second because they have invested a massive amount of time and money in developing AI-focused tools that are accelerated by their TensorRT backend in both Adobe and DaVinci software. For example, there are now elements of RTX voice used in speech enhancement, IntelliTrack AI that helps with stabilization, and Ultra NR for noise reduction. These are actually invaluable tools right here at the office in our own workflow that are not just supported, but also dynamically accelerated with NVIDIA GPUs. And for now, that's something lagging behind for the Arc series. Something else that seems to be lagging behind with the B580 is competitive rendering times in Blender, at least within the cycle-based scenes like this one. The new card barely beats the A580 and is seriously behind the A700 series and RTX cards. And when we switched up to the EV rendering engine, the numbers took a turn for the worse. None of the Intel GPUs gave what I would call acceptable performance. That could easily be chalked up to a lack of one API op optimizations within this specific renderer. But the B580's numbers point towards there being a bigger underlying issue with its overall compatibility. Moving on to viewport performance in some STEM apps, and in general, this is another area where Arc GPUs really need to improve. While yes, the B580 does offer much better performance in SolidWorks than even the A770, Nvidia and especially AMD are just way, way out front. Meanwhile, in 3DS Max, the story is pretty much the same, but the B580 does narrow the gap with the RTX 46 somewhat. Then again, based on our gaming results, these numbers should be a whole lot better. There's also a distinct advantage here for GPUs with more VRAM. That's why the 7600 XT and 3060 are so far ahead when compared to the vanilla 7600 and the 4060. Handbrake? Well, this is a program that shows us that when everything works properly, the ARC B580 can be a pretty dominant little card, especially when its media encode and decode engines get involved in the outputs. And our last stop in this sort of like whirlwind tour of B580 performance is those promised AI workloads. And, and look, I, I need to just level with everybody here. There's a huge caveat when it comes to any AI testing right now. And that's just the fact that the market and the environment is evolving so fast. So these results and the optimizations that sort of like carry them could literally change overnight. So our first stop is with the Procyon cross-platform AI benchmarks inference test and the immaturity of certain platforms jumps out right away. Whereas Nvidia and Intel can use their native AI processing environments, AMD doesn't have support here. So it defaults to Windows ML. As a result, their performance lands firmly in the gutter. Meanwhile, Intel's own revised XMX engines really end up turbocharging the B580 to the point where it outperforms everything else here by a substantial margin. Moving on to image generation, and while that smaller generation model shows a narrow advantage for the B580 or the RTX 4060, the XL version just demolishes any GPU with eight gigs of memory or less. Overall, that means the 580's lead widens by a huge margin, while cards like the RTX 4060 and 7600 fall way, way 
further behind to the point where the RTX 3060 and 7600 XT start building sizable leads. Moving beyond synthetic tests, we've got a few more real world scenarios for people who might want to sort of dabble with on-device AI models. And here we start to see a few other trends developing. First of all, Intel is generally behind everyone else, even with the B580 outperforming its predecessors. Also, eight gig cards are just terrible options for AI. I cannot emphasize that enough, especially when they're confronted with larger instruction sets. That's why the RTX 4060 and 7600 get absolutely massacred here. As a matter of fact, I'd never ever recommend the 4060 for AI workloads, and AMD is pretty hopeless too, at least for now. On the other hand, the B580, well, there's certainly some potential here, but I have a feeling that Intel's performance is simply being held back by the fact that there's no open Vino path for these workloads. Once that happens, we might have a real competitor on our hands. All right, so where does that all leave us when it comes to the Arc B580? And let's cut right to the chase. This thing has the potential to be a monster GPU for 250 bucks. You look at what Intel has done here, right? They have improved performance in a massive way versus Alchemist. This thing beats even the best A-series cards that are out there. Performance per watt has improved as well. The list, it just keeps going on. And looking at overall frame rates across all the games we tested, it's easy to get excited because at 1080p, it hangs with the RTX 4060 while beating the RX 7600 XT. Two G GPUs that cost quite a bit more money. Then at 1440p, where that VRAM payload gets dropped, well, it's actually able to become dominant in its average frame rates while being very narrowly overtaken by the RTX 4060 in 1% lows. So it feels like mission accomplished for Intel, right? Well, what those average numbers don't tell you is the one thing I've been pounding on for most of this video, consistency. Consistency is one area where Intel still tends to drop the ball every now and then. When it wins, this card, this card can absolutely wipe the floor with the competition. But there are so many times, especially in newer games, where it just slips up, sometimes by a lot, sometimes by a little bit. But it's very, very evident that there are still some struggles going on behind the scenes. Because overall, it feels like Intel's driver team is still playing, I guess, a little bit of catch up. Spotty optimizations sometimes show up in games and they're definitely a problem in creator and STEM focused applications. But as a counterpoint, this launch is like night and day versus what we went through with the A-Series. We didn't experience any games that were fundamentally broken, nor were there any straight out crashes like they were back then. So there's certainly improvements happening here, but there's still some ways to go. Also, you've got to remember, we were saying this exact same thing about AMD drivers not that long ago. So what does the Arc B580 ultimately tell us? Well, first of all, Intel can obviously build one hell of a GPU, even though in a lot of ways it feels like this is what should have been released a year or more ago. In addition to that, and I'm gonna stare right into the camera and talk to Nvidia and AMD right here, Intel has put everybody on notice, at least in this price point or even above it, the days of eight gig GPUs need to come to an end. And finally, while Intel may or may not launch future desktop cards, this is a fundamental point here, guys. With a unified architecture and driver stack between their IGPs and discrete GPUs, driver support will probably last a whole lot longer than a lot of people might expect. Well, I guess that pretty much wraps things up with this, this sort of fire hose of benchmarks that came to you in this video. I hope you appreciated it. I guess the amount of information that is coming to you in as condensed a manner as possible. But look, this is not the end of our B580 coverage. We've got one more video coming out with this card on older systems. And that is very, very eye-opening, I'll tell you that. But until that video, I'm Mike with Harvard Canucks and I'll see you in the next one. Have a great day, guys.